Funnily enough, I think one of the odd things even about the be open topic is actually even to be on a stage. Even the architecture of an idea, I think, shifts the dynamics. So please excuse me for being up here. I'd rather be down there discussing it with you in the round. But it is what it is. So to start off, in the end, it's all about life. Um, that was Le Corbusier, a man who actually spent a great deal of his life talking about the machine for living. And this was something he said at the end of his life. There were some other pretty good quotes, actually, he came out with around that time. One, I think, was something along the lines of, ultimately, life is always right, and the architect is always wrong. Those ones mysteriously actually are not the ones he's remembered for, but I think it's interesting. Today, it is possible to be unique and universal, um, to be local and international. I mean, it's pretty obvious to say, but with the communications revolution, Marshall McLuhan wasn't wrong with his idea of the global village, which he talked about in the early 60s. Today, you can communicate the local immediately. You can be in the same space. It makes such a difference. And the paradox today is that the thing that comes from a place can go places, whereas the international is strangely local. You now, the international style of Brazil is actually quite hard to transfer to another country. I mean, obviously, as you've just seen, you know, Italy is a very good example of that. It's an extremely powerful brand. Um, language, you know, English, at least for now, is the international language, you know. Esperanto never really quite took off. Food, again, it's the local that travels. Um, you know, even the ideal of travel has changed. So everybody now wants to go to places which are very specific. Eco-travel is growing so fast. I see it with clients coming into the studio. You know, pretty much every one of the developers that have been through the studio in the last year or so, whether they're from Georgia, whether they're from Russia, whether they're from Germany, whether they're from Sweden, show me the High Line as their example of what they'd really like to achieve. And it really makes me laugh, because the High Line is, you know, as you probably know, it was a totally a result of, you know, a few individuals fighting back. You know, it was a place where they walked their dogs, and then one day it was going to be demolished. And bad luck for the developers, these guys happened to be lawyers. So they worked out a way of saving it and of having an architecture competition and, you know, the rest is history, Dillis Gafidio won it, and now it's amazing. It's a playful, subversive, joyful experience where you can cruise through New York at a different height, but very unique and certainly universal. Um, so as a design approach, the unique and universal, the mass niche, if you like, is a way to create a contemporary commercial opportunity it is strategic, it's not just romantic. The specifics of a place or culture are hard to copy. And let's face it, you know, industry and the Industrial Revolution has moved elsewhere. China, India, Brazil. You know, we can't compete in terms of faster, cheaper, newer, more. But there are other ways. Um, and it's not just an old world proposition. After all, the search for identity is an issue that exists in many, many places in the world. Um, this next project I'm about to show you. Let's see if is it going to click. Um, this is a strategic project that we worked on. Fogo Island, Newfoundland. 
a place that definitely needs identity. Um, it's a project that we worked on with this extraordinary social entrepreneur, Zita Cobb, um, who was from the island, and the architect, Todd Saunders, who's from Newfoundland. We work with them to try and create an interior strategy. And they needed that more than they needed design as such, um, because what they wanted was an interior's identity that expressed the nature of the place to the world. It's a place that desperately needs to be communicated to the world because um, it used to make its money from cod fishing, and then um, at the end of the last century, there was a cod moratorium. So they're buggered, basically. Their economy is shot to pieces, and all the young people are leaving. So one of the key things of this strategy was both to make it somewhere that people would visit, but also to express their identity with pride, and, even trickier, to make sure that none of the money left the island. So this strategy had to be achievable, had to be buildable in a way that all the money stayed on the island. So we did an investigation. We looked into the things that made these men, the things they could do. Funnily enough, they've always been sustainable. They've never really had a money economy because it was basically about fishing half the year and then trading the fish for stuff through the local merchants. So cash was never really part of the story. They're extremely resourceful. They've had to be. All their um, materials came from packing cases. Um, it's a very specific local identity. Um, you know, textiles, patchwork, all make, do, and mend, you might say. They never had upholstery. It wasn't really part of their story. It was always rather hard furniture and quilts. The architect, Todd Saunders, has built a number of um, artist residences that's also part of the story, to attract the art world to the island and to give it recognition. So working with the building, we worked out a way of inhabiting the building in a way that the people who live on the island would feel comfortable there and it would attract visitors. Quite tricky, actually, because it's a long way to go, so it needed to be for people who could pay you know, enough money to make it worthwhile, but also work for the people who lived there. It had to be deliverable, so we had to come up with a mix of existing pieces they could make, the existing vernacular um, that they would be able to start making, so settles, benches, and so on. And then we created a network of designers who would come in and work with them individually to take those ideas on. So really, it was a strategy. Um, it's very nearly finished, so I'm very curious to see what happens. But certainly, the idea of none of the money leaving the island has been achieved. This, another project, again ended up as a strategy. It didn't start off as that, actually. It started as a place, but the place became the brand identity. Soho House, it was a project that we did now nearly 10 years ago. So, you know, it's not so much about the way it looks anymore, but it ended up embodying a culture. So the unique and universal, in this case, a load of guys who were in media, advertising, and, and film. We built them, if you like, a clubhouse and a hotel, a place where they would feel comfortable to work and play. So it was a very playful place. Um, a place for fun and games, which is definitely part of their story. Um, it became legendary for its playful pool on the roof. Um, they were rooms where you could take your kids, where you could take your girlfriend, um, where you could have meetings and then quickly um, close the curtain and have fun. They were very um, true to the place because it's an area that was co very obviously close to all the studios, to artists to designers. It was, you know, pre-meatpacking becoming what it is today. Um, but they were inhabitable rooms. They were very specific to that group. And it, was a f it became a third space, essentially. Really, the kind of 
the working space for that crowd, whether they were English, American, international. And the remarkable thing is, no one's copied it. It's so bizarre. You would think that one of the international hotels would have copied it by now. But no, not at all. You know, 10 years on, and still the idea of a place that's a world for a tribe, it's on its own. And if you look at that line, it's quite amazing. I mean, quite apart from the obvious upward spiral, it shows the value of design. Um, somewhere around 1998, the studio started to work with Soho House. I hope you can see, but Soho House New York is 2003, somewhere in that steep upward curve. And a couple of um, weeks ago, the company sold 50% for 250 million. And they're not buying it for the bricks and mortar, you know? Bringing together a world with design is powerful, it's strategic, it's a business decision as well as an aesthetic one. This quote I love. <laughs> I have seen the future, and it's very much like the present, only longer. <laughs> That's the thing. People often tend to think about the future as if it's going to be a very different place. And, you know, sometimes it is. There's lots of things beyond our control that make it different. But many of the things that we do now and will continue to do in the future are the same. We kiss, we cry, we go to the bathroom, we have sex, we work. You know, it's the same old story. So my approach to design is to look at buildings and their interiors as a continuum. They have a past, a present, and a future. In short, they have a life. I cut things vertically in terms of the ongoing story of a place rather than horizontally in terms, rather than saying that this moment in time is the defining, definitive moment when everything will be decided, which designers have a slight tendency of trying to do. I'm not nostalgic, but I also don't believe that the present provides all the answers. We're in a process of constant change. And I think what's interesting is to create what I call a frame for life so that people can inhabit it, but they can also change it. It can evolve without you. In the end, buildings are where we live, after all. But at the same time, they're grounded. So when I talk about a frame for life, I look at something that respects the building, the locality, the use and functionality, and of course, the people. And that is the thing that should amplify the life that's lived inside the building, that should accentuate it, give it shape. I see design as a 3D language, really. Um, it comes at the end of our process, not at the beginning. We always do a massive amount of research into a place before we even think about how it should look. And that means being open. You know, you have to use your senses. I always say that we've got two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. And we should use them in that proportion. You know, watch, listen before you jump to conclusions. Um, I think it's... If you can pin it down, it's something that exists independent of style. It's something that's about the psyche and the soul of the building, as was previously mentioned, the genius loci. You know, London, it doesn't really matter what the city of London looks like. Somehow it will always be a masculine, money-making, kind of rough and ready kind of place. You know, it's never going to be Milan and it's never going to be Rome. This is a project that um, we did in Stockholm for Matthias Dahlgren, a Swedish cook, and it's very much meant to express him. It's the ongoing story of him and his philosophy of food. It's a way of looking at the world. And the design is really completing a circle that involves him and his food. It doesn't exist independent of him. It expresses his values in a place, and it can evolve, and has. You know, it shouldn't be so fragile that one change and, you know, it's no longer the thing. This is the slightly posher restaurant next door. Um, when we started it, 
The Grand Hotel, who are his landlords, wanted it to be quite grand, but he's since become um, extremely well known in his own right, so they've given him a bit of leeway to make it more his own. And so we've changed it without changing it. When it comes to designing things, I think the same way, but obviously it's slightly different. You don't have a place, but you do have the culture of the company. You do have the place that goes with that. Um, and you have, obviously, the culture of the object itself, how it's used. So, for example, with George Jensen, I studied the company archives. Um, we went into the smithy. We understood how they approached what they do. And we looked at Danish culture and the whole idea of hookah, which is this idea of warmth in a cold climate. And in the end, we came up with a series of universal objects that add value to simple daily actions, that upgrade the ordinary. Part of that was, as I said, just looking into their culture. I mean, Hammershoi in particular, I don't know if you're familiar with his paintings, but they're amazing studies, quiet studies of domestic life. And so we've done a film, which you've nearly seen, um, which picks up from that. to Hammershoi, but there's nothing nostalgic about it. And I think it gives a really strong identity to those things. Thank you very much.